What's up, peers, and welcome to the World Crypto Network here with a reading of the must subscribe newsletter of the Bitcoin Optech Group. This net newsletter specifically is proof that you cannot miss even one single of these issues. Newsletter number 14 on September 25th, 2018. This week's newsletter includes action items and news related to last week's security release of Bitcoin Core version 0.16.3 and Bitcoin Core version 0.17 release candidate 4. Popular questions and answers from the Bitcoin Stack Exchange over the past month and a short description of notable mergers made to popular Bitcoin infrastructure projects. Upgrade to Bitcoin Core version 0.16.3 to fix the CVE 2018-17144. As widely reported earlier Friday, the denial of service vulnerability described in last week's Optech newsletter is now known to allow miners to trick affected systems into accepting invalid Bitcoins. As of this writing, it is believed that a majority of large Bitcoin services and miners have upgraded, likely ensuring that any blocks exploiting the bug will be quickly re reorganized out of the most proof-of-work chain. Reducing the risk for SPV clients and non-upgraded nodes. If you do not plan to upgrade or if you use an SPV client, you should consider waiting for more confirmations than you usually do. 30 confirmations, or about five hours worth, is a normal recommendation in these sorts of situations, as that's enough time for people to notice a problem and get warnings published. Otherwise, upgrading to one of the following versions remains highly recommended for any system, especially those systems handling money. Version 0.16.3, which is currently stable. Version 0.17, release candidate 4, which is the release candidate for the next major version. Version 0.15.2, but backporting to old versions may have other issues. Ver version 14.3, but again, backporting to older versions may have other issues. Allocate time to test the Bitcoin Core version 0.17, release candidate 4 as Bitcoin Core has uploaded the binaries for this release candidate. Testing is greatly appreciated and can help ensure the quality of the final release. News. The CVE 2018-17144, the initial and subsequent disclosure of information about this bug were the only significant news this week, but oh mighty, they are significant. For more information, we suggest reading the following sources. The official Bitcoin Core full disclosure. A fix for which was, re a fix for which was released on September 18th in Bitcoin Core version 0.16.3 and version 0.17 release candidate 4 includes both a denial of service component and a critical inflation vulnerability. It was originally reported to several developers working on Bitcoin Core, as well as projects supporting other cryptocurrencies, including Bitcoin ABC and Unlimited, on September 17th as a denial of service bug only. However, we quickly determined that this issue was also an inflation vulnerability with the same root cause and fix. In order to encourage rapid upgrades, the decision was made to immediately patch and disclose the less serious denial of service vulnerability concurrently with reaching out to miners, businesses, and other affected systems while de delaying publication of the full issue to give time for systems to upgrade. On September 20th, a post in the public forum reported the full impact and although it was quickly retracted, the claim was further circulated. At this time, we believe over half of the Bitcoin hash rate has upgraded to patched notes.
We are unaware of any attempts to exploit this vulnerability. However, it still remains critical that affected users upgrade and apply the latest patch to ensure no possibility of large reorganization, mining of invalid blocks, or acceptance of invalid transactions occur. Technical details. In Bitcoin Core version 0.14, an optimization was added with this pull request, which avoided a costly check during initial pre-relay block validation that multiple inputs within a single transaction did not spend the same input twice, which was added in 2012 with this pull request. While the UTXO updating logic has sufficient knowledge to check that such a condition is not violated in version 0.14, it only did so in a sanity check assertion and not with full error handling. It did, however, fully handle this case twice prior to 0.8. Thus, in Bitcoin Core version 0.14 and up, any attempts to double spend the transaction output within a single transaction inside of a block will result in an assertion failure and a crash, as was originally reported. In Bitcoin Core version 0.15, as part of the larger redesign to simplify the unspent transaction output, tracking and correct a resource exhaustion attack, the assertion was changed subtly. Instead of asserting that the output being marked spent was previously unspent, it only asserts that it exists. Thus, in Bitcoin Core version 0.15 and up, version 16.0 and version 0.16.1 and version 0.16.2, any attempt to double spend the transaction output within a single transaction inside of a block where the output being spent was created in the same block the same assertion failure will occur. As exists in the test case, which was included in the 0.16.3 patch. However, if the output being double spent was created in a previous block, an entry will still remain in the C coin map with the dirty flag set and having been marked as spent, resulting in no such assertion. This could allow a miner to inflate the supply of Bitcoin as they would be then able to claim the value being spent twice. Timeline. For September 17, 2018, all times in UTC. At 14.57, an anonymous reporter reports the crash bug to Peter Woolley, Gregory Maxwell, Vladimir Vandelan of Bitcoin Core, and Delnix of Bitcoin ABC, and SigPig of Bitcoin Unlimited. 1515, Gregory Maxwell shares the original report with Corey Fields, Suha Madhuwa, Alex Morkos, and Matt Carollo. 1747, Matt Carolla identifies the inflation bug. 1915, Matt Carollo first tries to reach Slashpool CEO to have a line of communication open to apply a patch quickly. 1929, Gregory Maxwell timestamps the hash of a test case which demonstrates the inflation vulnerability. 2015, John Newbery and James O'Bierren are informed of the vulnerability so that they can assist in alerting companies to the pending patch of the denial of service vulnerability. 2030, Matt Carolla speaks with Slashpool CTO and CEO and shares patch with disclosure of denial of service. 2048, Slashpool confirms upgraded. 2108, alert was sent to Bitcoin ABC that the patch will be posted publicly by 22,000. 2130, approximately, responded to the original reporter with an acknowledgement. 2157, Bitcoin Core pull request 14247, published with a patch and test demonstrating the denial of service bug. 2158, Bitcoin ABC publishes their patch. 2207, advisory email with link to the Bitcoin pull request and patch goes out to Bitcoin members, among others. And peers, this is why you should be absolutely a subscriber to the Bitcoin Optech newsletter, as you would have received an email of this critical bug 
within seven hours of it being disclosed. Peers, this is why you must be a subscriber of Bitcoin Optech. 2321. Bitcoin Core version 0.14, release candidate 4, is tagged September 18th, 2018. At 0024, Bitcoin Core version 16.3 is tagged. And at 2044, Bitcoin Core release binaries and release announcements were available. At 2147, Bitcoin Talk and Reddit have public banners urging people to upgrade. September, 2000, September 19th. 1406, the mailing list distributes an additional message urging people to upgrade by Peter Woolley. September 20th, 1950, David Jameson independently disclosed the vulnerability and it was reported to the Bitcoin Core security contact email. Back to the newsletter by Optech. We will not read the original confidential report, which is now public. We will also not read the additional technical information by Andrew Chow. And we will not read the National Vulnerability Database entry being updated by Luke Dash Jr. We are aware of several very insightful people currently reflecting upon the bug, its ultimate causes, and possible methods for reducing the risk of future serious bugs. An special good venue for Bitcoin Core internal discussion will be during the October 8th through 10th Core Tech TorDev Tech meetings following the Tokyo Scaling Bitcoin Conference. We plan to follow up with links to any significant conclusion that are published. Optech thanks the original reporter, Avmeni, for his responsible disclosure as well as the following development developers who unhesitantly made the time to quickly confirm the issue, address it, and provide, pr quickly provide round-the-clock monitoring for attempts to exploit then undisclosed information risk. Peter Woolley, Gregory Maxwell, Vladimir Vandalan, Corey Fields, Suha Draftun, Alex Marukas, and Matt Corolla. Selected Q&A from the Bitcoin Stack Exchange. The Bitcoin Stack Exchange is one of the first places where Bitcoin contributors look for answering of their own questions or when we have a few spare moments of time to help answering other people's questions. In this monthly feature, we highlight some of the top voted questions and answers made since our last update. How does the most recent found critical vulnerability work? The question is proposed by Hedge Dan Ledverit. If you were a miner, what are the steps you would take to create the extra 12.5 Bitcoin? Where is the source code of this exactly linked? Why can't this be done by a non-miner? And also, which forks are or were vulnerable? To the first part of the question, uh, which is here proposed in detail by Andrew Chow. So thank you, thank you very much for providing this very in-depth answers. There are two components to the CVE bug. There is a crash bug and an inflation bug. Both are triggered by almost the same scenario, a transaction containing an input multiple times. In general, how this would work is as follows. Let's suppose a miner has an unspent output A of one Bitcoin. They create a transaction with that input in twice. So input 1 spends from output A, and input 2 also spends from output A. The output of the transaction has value of 2 Bitcoin. Note how the output's value is larger than the value of output A. But if you had output A twice, the value is correct. The miner would then take this transaction and include it in a block that he is mining. Once the miner finds a valid block with the transaction included in it, he broadcasts it to the Bitcoin network. When a Bitcoin Core version 0.14x and above node receive this block, it will validate the block, but it will skip the duplicate input check because of the false parameter of this line. So the transaction the miner made will pass this step of validation and the other transaction validation step, including input script validation, until it reaches this loop. 
In this loop, the inputs to the transactions are being marked as spent in the UTXO database. The first time the duplicated input is seen, it is marked as spent. But the second time it is seen, the coin is already marked as spent. So coins bought and pass is null, will be true. This means that it will go into this if statement and subsequently hit the assert statement that follows. The assert causes the software to crash. For Bitcoin Core version 0 0.15 and 16 version 0 0.16.2, the behavior is different. This is due to the change in how the UTXO database is structured. Everything is largely the same until the same loop is reached. Here, instead of returning whether the output was spent, the spent coin actually returns whether the input exists in the database. So the first time, it will pass as expected, but the second time, instead of returning false, it still returns true. Looking at spent coin, you can see that it only returns false when it is unable to fetch the coin, which is object, res object representing the UTXO, from the database. With the new database structure, this makes sense, as the output should be removed from the database when it is spent. But if you look a few lines down, you see that it only deletes the coin when it is marked as fresh, in the case of a coin was fresh. Spent coin would delete the object on the first pass, so the second pass of the coin would not be found, and thus it would return false. This trigger this triggers the assert the following the fun function call, causing the nodes to shut down. If the coin was not fresh, the coin object itself is not deleted, but it contents it contents are cleared. This means that the second time the input is seen, the coin was not fresh. The spent coin would still return true, as the object still exists in memory, which means that it passes the assert that follows the spent coin, which causes the crash when the coin was not fresh. Then validation continues as normal, and the output this transaction creates is added to the UTXO database which means that money that should not exist now exists in the UTXO database. So now the question is, when are the UTXOs marked as fresh? They are marked as fresh when they are added to the UTXO database, but the UTXO database is still only in memory as cache. When it is saved to disk, the entries in memory are then no longer marked as fresh. This is savings to disks happens after every block, as well as all other times, but that is not important. Thus, if a miner has an output that was part of a transaction that has already confirmed and that spends the output twice in the same transactions, so that the transaction has two inputs that refer to the same output, and this transaction is not broadcasted to the network, but instead included in a block that he mines he is able to create a new output that has twice the value of the output that he spent, thereby creating coins. The next question, why can't this be done by a non-miner? The reason that this cannot be done by a non-miner is because the transactions that are received outside of the block are still checked for duplicate inputs. The transaction will be rejected as invalid and not added to the node's mempool. So the transaction will never get into a candidate block. It is only transactions with duplicate inputs that get into blocks that trigger this vulnerability. And thus only miners can do this as they must knowingly insert an invalid transaction into their block. Also, which forks are or were vulnerable? Any forks whose software includes following commit this would mean any software forked from the pulled in change from Bitcoin Core after November 10th, 2016. Again, phenomenal answer by Andrew Chow. Next question on the Bitcoin Stack Exchange, proposed by this user. Why does Bitcoin use UDP to do block propagation? Bitcoin uses TCP 
for P2P, for the peer-to-peer, -peer, but why is UDP not used? Modern day internet has relatively low packet loss rate to UDP is reliable. Even if some packets are dropped, the peers can always request for the blocks. With TCP, the network is rather static, construct, constructed, whereas UDP, you can construct a random graph each time a block is propagated as it is continuousless. Nano uses UDP, and I think it's a good approach. I'm curious as to if I'm missing something. Bootstrapping can obviously be done using TCP. And the following very detailed answer is provided by Gregory Maxwell. Thank you very much. The Bitcoin system does not yet have, does not just have one network protocol. Any way of obtaining the blocks is equally valid. Blocks over Freenet, over satellite broadcast, over P2P network, all work just as well and are used in practice. UDP is used in Bitcoin too by the fiber protocol. As far the common Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer protocol goes, UDP is not an especially good fit for most operations that it performs. Bitcoin needs to reliably send messages for larger, trans larger than IP packets, like transactions and blocks. Although the internet is reliable, packets loss rate of 1.3, 1 to 3% are common. This means that any application needed to communicate large messages with UDP must implement packetization, transmission, retransmission, reordering, etc. The same thing that TCP already implements for us. Many applications that have rolled their own TCP in use space have ended up with exploitable bugs in them. So it isn't something that should be done without good cause. UDP also has the issue of NAT traversal, getting bidirectional commits communication across a NAT with UDP is not a simple matter. Crossing anything more complicated than a full cone NAT requires considerable amounts of special code, but without it, there will be many hosts that just can't talk to the other peers with UDP. You mentioned connect, connectionlessness, allowing you relay to other random nodes in the network. But in Bitcoin peer-to-peer, -peer, we make use of the consistent relationship between nodes to make the network more reliable and efficient. Nodes have an idea what their peers already know and can avoid sending them redundant data. Nodes have an Nodes also know which peer have been fastest in sending them blocks in the past and handle them specially. Likewise, even if the protocol is connectionless, there are costs to processing messaging from peers by prioritizing handling messages from existing peers. Bitcoin reduces the impact of some kinds of DOS attacks, handling larger than one packet messages, retransmitting, etc also means that having with the connectionless transport, there is still need for some kind of persistent state. But as an implementation, but an if implementation did want to randomly connect to send messages, it could at an extra cost is a couple round trips for the handshake or not even that. There are about 10,000 reachable nodes in the P2P network that wouldn't be much of a challenge in holding open a mostly idle TCP connection to each of them over to each and every one of them if all the state retained were just the TCP state. So for that point, the use of UDP would at best just be an optimization for something that could already be done but isn't done. I think it would be more interesting to demonstrate the usefulness of having all those connections first before worrying about optimizing it. So why might UDP transactions be useful for the Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer protocol? To get lowest latency block transfers possible, there must be no round trips, even in the face of packet loss, which precludes TCP and which is why Fiber uses UDP. 
but to get no round trips, the protocol must be able to handle loss within retransmission and to get low latency, a block must be decodable within a minimum amount of data received. This requires very sophisticated error correction techniques, which are an evolving area and have not been matured enough to yet consider mainstreaming them. The latency benefit of fiber also exists so long as a small number of hosts are using it. Since it does not, since it does the heavy lifting of talking, taking blocks all around the world, round trips don't cause much harm on low latency links. And this latency concerns only applies to block relays. Unlike TCP, UDP requires some amount of NAT traversal handling to simply get bidirectional communication working. But combining with full NAT traversal, handling UDP is often able to establish communication between hosts, which are both behind different NATs. This could be helped for the Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer network since most hosts are unreachable behind the ANAT. A ironically, you, so ironically, one of UDP's challenges is also one of its uses. However, to connect hosts, which are both behind a NAT, the assistance of a third-party non-netted host is required along with even more NAT traversal code. Considering the complexity of traversing improving Bitcoin support for TCP port mapping, for example, implementing NAT PMP, would probably be a better run on investment right now. Use of UDP would allow the worst than best effort traffic handling. For low priority bulk traffic, like syncing the blockchain, it would be nice if the traffic carefully shaped itself to avoid interfering with other traffic on the network. Alternatively, congestion control algorithms like LEPBAT make it possible to transfer low priority data with minimal impact. But since TCP stacks don't yet commonly support these congestions control approaches, applications that want them currently need to implement their own transports. For Bitcoin, it would be ideal if we could just flip a socket option to turn LED BAT on and off on existing connections, for example, when the peer is requesting historical blocks, or in the future when someone like Fiber is being used by the node to relay new blocks. But that isn't an option yet. The last two reasons are the reason that Bit BitTorrent usually uses BTB. Again, amazing explanation by Gregory Maxwell. Thank you very much. Next question. What prevents someone from tainting the coin tumbling pool of the Wasabi wallet? A question asked by Patoshi. Wasabi is a new type of wallet with the built-in tumbler, if I'm correct. What stops someone from tainting the tumbling pool of coins with non-approved coins? I'm, wary, I'm wary of using these privacy tools as I don't want my Coinbase account frozen just because someone mixed a bad coin in the lot. And the answer comes here from Napara, the developer of the Wasabi wallet and one of the co-authors of the Zero Link framework, which utilizes the Charmian coin joins. There are a number of reasons why this kind of back blacklisting is problematic in practice. But take it with a grain of salt, because I am the creator of Wasabi, so I'm biased. <laughs> the elliptic report identifies 0.65% of all Bitcoin transactions are mixing transactions. This means if that kind of blacklisting would happen, they would have to blacklist most Bitcoins in existence. The same report also states that 50% of darknet markets users don't use any mixing, but directly send to exchanges. Mind-blowing, I know. And these are the coins being blacklisted. From another point of view, Wasabi's anonymity set will be constantly constant 100. And if a coin from it is tainted, it would really blacklist all mixed coins, where every coin has exactly 1% chance of being the tainted one. 
the user base of the traditional Bitcoin mixers is limited to a certain type of user who is in desperate need of privacy and in order to get it, he is willing to risk losing money. Since coin loss and other issuance issues are architecturally impossible with Wasabi, our target user is not limited to them. The target user of Wasabi Wallet is everyone because everyone needs privacy. If someone is extremely paranoid, he can just coin, he can spend coins to himself a couple of times before, before sending it to the desired legitimate place. This is what Samurai's Ricochet is doing. Speaking of legitimacy, CK Snacks, the company behind Wasabi, is a legitimate company. Privacy is not only not a crime, but a fundamental human right. And if an entity would blacklist a mixed output, they would be looking ahead of legal trouble. If such a thing would ever happen, please notify us. Again, thank you very much for this answer, Nopara. And especially, thank you very much for making Wasabi possible. What is the minimum possible number of an ECDSA private key? The question by John Smith. A private keys are 256-bit numbers. I know the maximum possible number is something around this value, which I'm not going to read. <laughs> what about the minimum number possible? Thank you. And we have two answers. The first one by Merch. The all zero bit string does not have a corresponding public key per the standard. According to our all possible elliptic curve private keys valid on the crypto as E. Um, so it is 0001. And another answer by Gregory Maxwell, one is the, minimum, is the minimum number. The space intentionally left on blank. As usual, amazing questions here on the Bitcoin Stack Exchange. Let's continue reading the Bitcoin Optech newsletter with notable commits. Notable commits in this week's in Bitcoin Core, LND, and C Lightning. Remember, new merges to Bitcoin Core are made to its master development branch and are unlikely to become part of the upcoming version 0.17 release. You'll probably have to wait until version 0.18 in about six months from now. A Bitcoin Core merge. When connected to the peer-to-peer -peer network, nodes share the IP address of other nodes they've, they, they have heard about, and these addresses are stored in a database that Bitcoin Core queries when it wants to open a new connection. This pull request adds a new RPC command, get node address, that returns one of these addresses. This can be useful in conjunction with tools like Bitcoin Submit Transactions. A light LND merge, the logic of validating channel updates has been moved to the routing package so that it's available both in routing to be handled failed payment sessions and in the gossiper where it was handled before. This fixes the following issue and implements a test case for it that may have allowed a node to trick one of its peers into believing a different peer had a routing failure, thus possibly redirecting traffic to a malicious node. A C Lightning now improves Gossip With tool that allows you to receive gossip from a node independently of Lightning D, or even to send the remote node a message. This tool is used for additional testing of Lightning D's gossip component. C Lightning now complies with updates to Bolt 7 by splitting the previous flag field for the Listen Channels RPC into two new fields, message flags and channel flags. Also, code comments reference to Bolt 2 and Bolt 11 have been updated. Sea Lightning has significantly expanded the in-code documentation of its secret module. The documentation is remarkably good and at times quite humorous. See hsmd.c. The code comments even document other code comments. For example, you'll find fix me like this scattered throughout the code. Sometimes they suggest simple improvements which sometimes, like yourself, should go ahead and implement, 
Sometimes they're deceptive quagmires, which will cause you nothing but grief. You decide. And another comment: Fix me. We should cage that. Get channel seed, C ID, C D B ID, and channel seed. Derive funding key of and channel seed and funding public key and funding private key. And last but not least, the C Lightning can now make multiple requests in parallel to Bitcoin D, speeding up operations on slow systems or on nodes performing long runtime operations. Peers, I do believe that this newsletter proved it, that you absolutely have to subscribe to the Bitcoin Optech newsletter, which is a plethora of resources and information. And again, if you were subscribed to the Bitcoin Optech newsletter, you would have received uh, notice of this, of the critical inflation bug, or at least the denial of service bug, only seven hours after it was initially disclosed. So, peers, absolutely uh, subscribe to the Bitcoin Optech newsletter, and especially thanks uh, to all the contributors uh, who make this happen. Peers, thank you very much, and see you on the next show. Bye bye.